Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can talk about the mother-daughter relationship in a situation where the mother is narcissistic. So really I'll be talking about maternal narcissism. This is actually a fairly common situation that counselors see in clinical work. So I'm going to cover this by looking at the nine signs of the narcissistic mother. So here, again, I'm specifically looking at the mother-daughter relationship, but some of these, of course, would apply to other parent-child combinations, mother-son, father-son, and father-daughter, which brings me to kind of the first step in this answer, and that's to look at narcissistic parents in general. So I'm going to move from narcissistic parents to parenting styles, and then take a look at the characteristics of the narcissistic mother, and then look a little bit at the consequences of having a narcissistic mother. So narcissism is a personality construct. We see that it includes characteristics like being self-centered, a sense of entitlement, requiring admiration, and generally it's divided up into two types. We have a grandiose type where somebody is socially dominant, extroverted, arrogant, and resistant to criticism. This is a fairly obvious manifestation of narcissism. It's also called overt narcissism for that reason. And then we have vulnerable narcissism. And here we see characteristics like shame, a hypersensitivity to criticism, being resentful. It's a little bit more hidden. And it's also called covert narcissism for that reason. Like all personality constructs, it's thought that narcissism occurs because of genetics and because of the environment. And we've seen a lot of research around dividing up the contribution of each of these to narcissism. We see that the heritability of narcissism is somewhere between 47 and 64 percent, which means that the environmentability is somewhere between 36 and 53 percent. Usually I just run under the assumption that the contribution is roughly 50-50. So one of the questions I hear a lot is, can a narcissistic mother cause a narcissistic daughter? This is one of the concerns that comes up because people, of course, a lot of times don't want to be narcissistic and they're afraid that being exposed to somebody who's narcissistic, especially an important figure like a mother, may lead to narcissism. So we see a number of theories about how this could happen. We know that narcissistic parenting is tied to narcissism, but we're not really clear on what mechanism really leads to it. There's one theory that too much gratification can lead to narcissism, too little can lead to it. Under the too much theory, a child comes to expect that much gratification, and when they don't get it in real life, they create it for themselves. Again, narcissism. Under the too little theory, they need the gratification, and they're not getting it, so they create it for themselves. Again, this leads to narcissism. We think that, again, narcissistic parents can cause narcissism, but the research findings are a little mixed on this area. And this brings me to the area of parenting styles. This is really interesting specifically around this question of the narcissistic mother because it really looks at the contribution of the mother and the father to narcissism separately. So essentially one way to look at parental styles is there's four. There's four styles. Authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, and indifferent. So with authoritarian, a parent wants to maintain control. They want to shape and evaluate their child to a standard. Obedience is expected and no explanation is necessary. So the parent gives a command and they're not going to explain why they're demanding obedience. With authoritarian parenting, punishment brings about compliance. That's how compliance is obtained. With authoritative, the authoritative parent uses reasoning and explanation to influence a child's behavior. So their standards are clear. Parents like this are assertive, but not overly assertive. They're not intrusive. And they assume the child has rights and they will consider the child's point of view. A permissive parenting style involves a lot of affection. The parents are lenient. They really struggle to punish a child, and they do not expect a child to be mature. And then the last one is the indifferent parenting style. Here we see that the child is left to figure out problems by themselves. They're encouraged to be independent of the parent. The parent doesn't offer them any support, and again, the child is supposed to take responsibility really for everything in their own life. Right, So all of these parenting styles essentially have pros and cons, but generally the authoritative style is considered the healthiest. So then looking at the unhealthy styles and comparing them to 
narcissism, how narcissism may develop. This is where I think it gets fairly interesting. We see from research that with the authoritarian style, when used by a mother, it's positively correlated with the development of vulnerable narcissism in the child. Now, when a mother uses a permissive style, this is negatively related to vulnerable narcissism, and so is the authoritative style. That means specifically as the mother uses these styles, vulnerable narcissism is lower in the child, right? So it does not contribute to the development of vulnerable narcissism. Now, the indifferent style is unrelated. So if the mother uses that style, we don't really see any difference with vulnerable narcissism. Now, in terms of grandiose narcissism, we see that the mother's parental styles are not related to grandiose narcissism. So it would seem that really nothing that a mother can do can lead to grandiose narcissism. But there are some things a mother can do that could lead to vulnerable narcissism, again, in the child. Now, if we look at the other side of this, on the father's side, we see that authoritarian and indifferent parenting styles, again, when used by a father, are related to a child developing grandiose narcissism. And in terms of the permissive style, this is negatively related, again, when used by the father, to grandiose narcissism. Now, interestingly, parenting styles, when used by the father, are not related to vulnerable narcissism. So it would appear that fathers can't cause vulnerable narcissism, but they may be able to contribute through their parenting styles to the development of grandiose narcissism. So narcissistic parents may cause narcissism, but that's only really one concern. And again, I'll talk about the consequences of specifically a narcissistic mother after I talk about the characteristics of the narcissistic mother. So looking at these characteristics, I gathered these from the research literature and from my clinical experience. Again, this is a very common issue brought up in clinical work. So the first characteristic, the first sign of a narcissistic mother is diverting the conversation to themselves. So the daughter wants to talk to the mother about a problem the daughter is having. And somehow the conversation becomes about a problem that the mother is having. The mother's problem is always more important, more serious, worse, and sometimes even caused by the daughter. This is also fairly common. So the daughter says, I'm having trouble focusing, getting things done. Life is hectic. And the mother says, I know the feeling. It's exactly how I felt when I was raising you, because you would never listen. You always wanted to do things your own way. You never understood how I felt. So the daughter was looking for support or advice, not criticism, but criticism is what she found. So there's this sense on the part of the daughter, there's this thought like, how this conversation even get here? Right? So that's the first sign. Again, diversion to a topic related to the narcissistic mother. The second sign is competing with the daughter. We see this expressed in a lot of different ways, where the mother hits on the daughter's boyfriends. They compete for the love of the daughter's father, right? So the narcissistic mother's husband. There is a sense that the daughter will never be good enough for the mother or as accomplished as the mother, right? This sets up this competition. The mother treats the daughter as if the daughter is inferior specifically an inferior version of the mother, a version that never really lived up to the mother. The third sign is the mother makes the daughter feel as if the daughter is a burden and really should have never been born in the first place. And I think this is a particularly cruel and damaging characteristic of the narcissistic mother. And unfortunately, it's also a very common characteristic. Sign number four is a failure to protect the daughter from another harmful individual perhaps somebody else in the household who mistreated the daughter. And sometimes this goes as far as the narcissistic mother actually protecting the person who is causing the harm. This also seems to be extremely common with mothers who are narcissistic. They really don't care if the daughter is being mistreated or in a sense they enjoy it. They believe it's just because now the daughter is being punished for being such a bad daughter. So just like really all these signs, it's very cruel. It's a cruel and merciless characteristic of the narcissistic mother. The fifth sign is emotional unavailability. So the narcissistic mother doesn't want to or doesn't know how to talk about emotions. Something else I see, which is kind of related, is the wrong kind of emotional availability. So not necessarily unavailability, but again, the wrong kind of availability like making too much of the daughter's emotions. So the daughter says something like, 
I'm angry and hurt by what this other person did. And the mother says, you may be dangerous or violent. I always knew you had that in you. I could never really trust you. I can't know that you're going to be safe. So in one sense, it does the same thing as being emotionally unavailable in that the daughter doesn't want to keep approaching the mother about emotions. The daughter doesn't want to talk about her emotions because things get all twisted around in the mother's perspective. Essentially, with this sign, we see no validation, invalidation, or very little validation of feelings. So sign number six is being controlling and manipulative. So we see this through guilt trips. We see a lot of drama when the daughter doesn't meet expectations. Like, for example, if the daughter gets in minor trouble at school, the mother might say, I'm hurt, disappointed, shocked, or disgusted. So really just blowing something relatively small way out of proportion, and again, making it about themselves. We also see a look of disappointment, sometimes instead of a clear statement. So instead of verbal communication, just a stare or a look of profound disappointment. Again, meant to be manipulative, not authentic, not genuine. The seventh sign of narcissistic mother is this idea of a debt that cannot be repaid. So what this means is the narcissistic mother sacrificed tremendously to have a daughter, and in doing so really incurred this debt that can never be repaid by the daughter. She wants the daughter to be impressed by this sacrifice. And if the daughter is not impressed by this sacrifice, the daughter is ungrateful and again a disappointment. So we see a really clear theme kind of emerging through these different signs. Sign number eight is that the narcissistic mother gives approval or in a sense love as a reward for doing what she wants. This means that there's no unconditional approval or love. It's all based on the performance of the daughter. And I think some would argue that really conditional love, and that's what this is really creating, is not really love at all. If the daughter has to win or gain through her own performance approval or love, is that really the same thing as love? Is that what we're really talking about when we talk about love? Now the nice sign of a narcissistic mother really has to do with boundary violations. So searching the daughter's room, eavesdropping on conversations, reading the daughter's diary, providing the daughter really no privacy, and a lot of judgment, which of course is partially based on the things that the mother discovers by violating the privacy. Another part of this would be complaining about the daughter to other people with the daughter present, again, a boundary violation. So really, by putting the daughter down in front of others, this is crossing kind of an important parenting boundary right? It's not conducive to a good relationship, and it leads to a number of consequences. So this kind of leads me from the signs of a narcissistic mother to the consequences of the narcissistic mother. So this is really interesting because, in essence, the narcissistic mother can be destructive because, quite understandably, daughters believe their mothers. In general, children believe their parents. We believe that our parents have the answers. We believe that what they say is correct. We believe that they know best. We believe that they know what they're doing. Even though sometimes there's really no evidence to support this. There's no requirement for parents to be logical, reasonable, or rational to have children. The theorist who invented rational mode of behavior therapy, Albert Ellis, used to say that he believed that psychopathology, to some extent, was caused because we believed our parents. What do parents really know? What evidence is there that a parent would know better than you at the same age, right? So for example, a narcissistic mother who becomes a mother at age 30 and she knows a certain amount about life, when that daughter becomes 30, what evidence is there that that daughter would not know as much as that mother? But that's kind of what people think, that their parents must know better. Another part of this is when a mother fails to provide something, a child would not be aware of what that is. We don't know what we don't know which really creates a chronic feeling of emptiness in that daughter. And interestingly, this is one of the symptoms of borderline personality disorder, which overlaps somewhat with vulnerable narcissism. That type of narcissism, in theory, that a mother could cause to some extent. So back to that believing the narcissistic mother. What the narcissistic mother wants a daughter to believe is that the daughter is worthless, not good enough. That the daughter is there to meet the needs of the mother, that the daughter is a failure and will continue to be a failure as they grow up. To the extent that the daughter fails, 
it is the daughter's fault. And the extent that the daughter succeeds, the mother takes credit or just denies that the daughter was successful at all. So the daughter of the narcissistic mother is led to believe it's your fault that your mother is displeased with you. That's in essence kind of the bottom line. The daughters of narcissistic mothers struggle in certain areas, right? We see certain characteristics, shame, anger, not trusting oneself, like not trusting one's inner voice, a feeling of uncertainty, feeling incompetent, feeling hypersensitive, and difficulty setting healthy boundaries. So if a daughter had a narcissistic mother or has a narcissistic mother, what can they do about it? Well, I think the only advice here really is to seek counseling. It's important for somebody to separate what's true and not true in that relationship, to build confidence in the validity of their own feelings, to acknowledge that the mother, perhaps through no fault of her own, failed you as the daughter, and in essence, failed you in the worst possible way by making you think it was your fault. Another question I get here is, should the relationship be terminated? Should the daughter cease any contact with the narcissistic mother? Well, this is an extremely difficult decision. As with all things, I think consulting a counselor really makes the most sense here. But one of the things that occurs to me is that, biologically anyway, somebody only gets one mother. And termination of a relationship is different than ceasing contact. They may appear to be the same thing, but I don't think they really are. I'm not sure that a relationship like the mother-daughter relationship, or really any parent-child relationship, can ever be terminated in the truest sense just through not having contact with the parent. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's this belief that one person can choose to end a relationship, but there's really more than one step to this. Not having any contact is making a choice to do that in one sense, but just because there's no contact, that doesn't mean that the relationship is truly ended. It only really ends when somebody can find peace with it. So the relationship can technically end. Somebody cannot have contact with that person. They cannot talk to that person and all that. But the effect doesn't end. The effect of a mother-daughter relationship can persist beyond the absence of contact, beyond death even. I've seen this so many times. A daughter is struggling to find peace with the relationship even when the mother is no longer here. The feelings are just as painful as when the mother was alive. The mother-daughter relationship isn't really something that people so much escape or ignore as they do resolve. And again, I think counseling can help with that. So I know whenever I talk about topics like the mother-daughter relationship and narcissism, there'll be a variety of opinions, people who agree with me and disagree with me, and have other thoughts from examples in their own life. Please put those opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this video on nine signs of a narcissistic mother to be interesting. Thanks for watching.